In November 2025, an attacker exploited the low liquidity of a meme coin PopCat on Hyperliquid to execute a sophisticated market manipulation. The attack resulted in a $4.9 million real loss for the platform's liquidity provider pool, known as HLP. As the losses mounted, Hyperliquid posted an announcement, system maintenance, withdrawals suspended. The real story here isn't the price drop or even the attack itself. It's about what that announcement truly meant. It all started with 3 million USDC. The attacker distributed these funds across 19 newly created wallets. The objective was simple, to bypass single account limits and combine these scattered positions into one massive time bomb within the system. These 19 wallets collectively opened over $20 million in long exposure on the extremely illiquid PopCat perpetual contract. The next step was the key to the entire attack. They placed a massive buy wall at $0.21. This $20 million of artificial depth created the illusion that the market was being propped up by immense, genuine buying pressure. Once retail investors and algorithmic trading programs were lured in, the attacker instantly canceled all their buy orders. The price immediately plummeted. All 19 wallets were liquidated simultaneously, but the liquidation itself wasn't the problem. The problem was, who would take over these long positions? To understand how the loss occurred, you first need to know what HLP is. In Hyperliquid's design, there are no traditional market makers. HLP is a unified vault of capital composed of funds deposited by users. It performs three main functions. It acts as a counterparty to every trader. It collects fees during normal market conditions. And when liquidation has no other taker, it absorbs all the bad debt. Simply put, if you go long, HLP goes short. If you go short, HLP goes long. And if you get liquidated, HLP takes over your position. So in this incident, when the liquidation orders hit a market with virtually no depth, all of those toxic positions were dumped directly onto HLP. The attacker lost their initial $3 million, HLP lost $4.9 million. Why? Because the system is designed, HLP must be the buyer of last resort. Within minutes of the loss, Hyperliquid's reaction was swift. Deposits and withdrawals for HLP were frozen. The cross-chain bridge to Arbitrum was paused. All user-facing withdrawal functions were disabled, with public announcement, system maintenance. Developers in Discord called it an automated protection mechanism, but Blockchain Record noted what appeared to be a manual admin command being triggered. You do not need to guess which version is true. The only fact that matters is this. The bridge was shut down. Withdrawals were halted. User assets were trapped on the chain. Your on-screen balance was still there, but there was no way to withdraw. The risk exposed at that moment is far more significant than the $4.9 million loss. We've discussed this in a previous episode. On-chain exchanges often run their matching and liquidation engines on their own app chain or layer 2, but most user assets originate on Ethereum or other L1 chains. There are two ways for funds to enter these systems. One is a cross-chain bridge. Your USDC is locked in a smart contract on Ethereum, and the hyperliquid chain mints you an IOU. This IOU is what represents your balance on that chain. Therefore, if the bridge is paused, your IOUs cannot leave. Your assets are effectively trapped with no exit ramp back to the Ethereum mainnet. The PopCat incident is the clearest example of this sequence. Internal market stress leads to a bridge pause, which leads to locked-in users' funds. The vulnerable point was not the Oracle, the liquidation engine, or the order book. The bridge was the true single point of vulnerability. The other path is to entrust the deposit process to a regulated custodian. They hold your real assets and then issue a corresponding representation on the chain. This approach reduces the technical risk of a cross-chain bridge, but it introduces a new dependency, the stability and reliability of the custodian itself. Neither path is a perfect solution. They simply trade one set of risks for another. The PopCat incident is not a story about a super smart attacker. It's a story that exposes a more fundamental reality of on-chain trading. In the world of on-chain DEXs, the final arbiter of whether you can withdraw your funds back to the mainnet is not the contract code, it's the bridge. When that bridge closes, you instantly go from being an on-chain user to an in-chain prisoner. Your balance is visible, but you cannot leave the system. In essence, this is no different from a centralized exchange halting withdrawals. It's just the packaging, wrapped in the language of chains, nodes, and self-custody. The PopCat incident was the first time many realized a critical truth. As soon as you rely on a bridge, the controller of that bridge holds the key to the final exit for your funds. On-chain order books can solve the problem of transparency, but the cross-chain bridge is what determines if you can ever get your money back. The real linchpin was never about how open a smart contract is. It's about who has the power to press the pause button. And the PopCat incident was the moment this reality was laid completely bare for everyone. <laughs>